So thank you everybody for being here this morning. We are here as part of our micro MBA sessions on leadership. And Dr. Lee is gonna have a unique introduction. If you read the article about six tests for physicians and their leaders in the decade ahead, you've seen his official titles. So you know that he's editor in chief of the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. He's on the editorial board of the New England Journal. He's a professor at Harvard, he's the chief medical officer of Press Gaining. But what he really is, is number one, a really great person and great human. The second thing I'm gonna tell you is a title that I just thought of this morning for Tom. Um, it's been used for other people. He's America's doctor. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is when a patient comes in to see a doctor, the doctor listens to the patient, does a physical exam, gets some numbers, and then writes a prescription. And the title of American doctor has gone to, at times, the Surgeon General. Uh, some might say Dr. Fauci might be America's doctor right now because he's available so often in the media, or our own Bill Schaffner, who has had 77 billion imprints apparently recently. But the only person that I'm aware of who actually acts like America's doctor is Tom Lee. He is aware from travels and communications with not just his patients who will be seeing immediately after this presentation, but physicians, and leaders in healthcare systems and systems themselves. And when he takes this information in, he then wants some numbers. So because he's familiar with so many locations, he knows what programs have been initiated. He knows what the numbers look like. And then he can reflect and think, what kind of a prescription should I write? And today you're gonna to be looking at one of the prescriptions that he's written to actually behaves like America's doctor. And this just came to me about 10 minutes ago. So this is a different kind of introduction I've ever done before. It is an honor and a privilege to open this up for Dr. Thomas Lee to inform us today. And he has a list of names for participants in case he wants to make it an interactive session to call on people. Tom, it's an honor. Thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure, and it's very kind to you. Uh, and it is true. I, I, I practice uh, primary care and cardiology, and my patient session, which is supposed to begin 45 minutes from now, I push back, and but like uh, 55 minutes from now, uh, I've got to do my first virtual visit. My necktie is on for my patients uh, more than you guys, because I know you guys aren't expecting it. Uh, but uh, I, look, I'm... I, I'm very uh, delighted to be talking to you. My oldest daughter is an MD, MBA. Uh, she's a cardiology fellow right now at the Brigham. And uh, I'm very tuned in to thinking about your situation and the challenges that are right in front of you uh, right now. And uh, one reason why I wanna put attention on the decade ahead is that, you know, I work a lot with, um, I've got this cousin, you know, some of you have heard of her, I'm sure. Her name's Angela Duckworth. She's the psychologist at Penn. She wrote, uh, she wrote and speaks about grit and, you know, she won MacArthur Prize and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and she is, a, she's a great person and she's been a big influence on me and we've written some stuff together. But one of the things that Angela um, uh, says uh, is useful for people to maintain their grit through difficult times, grit where you keep pushing and try to get better, um, is you should try projecting yourself out in the future. Imagine that you're, you know, out there beyond COVID and you're looking back on how, how we behaved and how we performed during COVID. Imagine that, you know, you're out there a decade from now and you're looking at what you did over the last decade. And you will probably come up with a lofty, noble, good idea for how you're gonna wanna look back at this time. And that that's a useful way for helping you 
hang in there and actually be that way. So you can arrive at that spot uh, in the year beyond COVID, in the, in the decade beyond where we are now and feel proud of what you've accomplished. I mean, you guys are where you are because you've, you've got a lot of reason to be proud now. Uh, you wanna be able to look back a decade from now and feel proud as well. Um, so, uh, the, you, you know, I, so thinking about what will it mean for you, for us, uh, you know, to be feeling that we were excellent a decade from now, uh, what will excellence mean for physicians and, and for the leaders of physicians? And I, I'm, I'm fully expecting the majority of you to be in the role of being physician leaders a decade from now. Uh, that's why you're doing this program. Uh, well, I think excellent. It's reasonable to say that um, excellence is going to be, you know, subjected to some unusual challenges. Uh, it is a time of unprecedented turmoil. Uh, you know, we're going to get this election behind us, uh, but there's still plenty of uh, excitement lying ahead. Uh, the COVID crisis is far from done. I'm sure many of you noticed that. Uh, the, the last two days since the election have been records for the number of cases of COVID in this country. Uh, the clinical challenges that we face in, in healthcare are, are been exacerbated by the changes in care redesign. So we both got the diseases of our patients and the challenges of redesigning what we do because of COVID. The financial models that fund traditional healthcare are buckling under COVID. COVID has been like a stress test. I mean, cardiologists like me uh, know that, uh, and I'm sure most of you know that no one passes or fails a stress test. Everyone stops eventually in a stress test. And the question is, what do you learn from what makes you stop and how far you go? And one of the things we've learned from COVID is that the financial models that have funded regular old healthcare fall apart when there's a pandemic or some other unusual challenge. There's this explosion of knowledge and the explosion of knowledge is not only trickling through to us, but it's also to patients as well. I mean, can you believe how many patients today know the difference between a PCR test and an antigen test and an antibody test? Um, it's amazing. I don't know that all of our clinicians knew the difference uh, a year ago. Um, We've got IT advances making every patient a big data challenge. Uh, you know, what I did before logging on with you was, was, was uh, spend time pulling together the data on my patients I'm going to be seeing this morning because if I try to do it when they're right in front of me on the screen, it's not going to go so great. And as it is, it's an overwhelming task. Uh, and then the physician workforce is changing. I mean, looking at all of you in the gallery mode, you look different than the people that Ron went to school with and that I went to school with uh, back when we were in our training days. Uh, there, uh, you know, most of the, the medical students and people coming out of medical school today are women. Uh, the default now are two working people in couples. I mean, like my wife and I, my wife is a physician too. And, uh, you know, the, you know, it, it changes the what it means to be a doctor for the better, frankly. Um, but it, with all these things changing, what should physicians and their leaders be setting as their goals? Well, if you go back a decade, um, so I wrote this article with Toby Cosgrove that you, you were asked to read in preparation uh, because a decade before, Toby, who is CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, and I had written another article at the request of Harvard Business Review. And that was about what it meant at that time to engage doctors <clears throat> in change. And it took us several years, it took us a few years to write it, so it didn't come out until 2014. We were busy doing our day jobs. Um, and, um, and what we wrote at that time uh, was going back to 2000, the early years of the, the previous decade, uh, we wrote how physicians were deeply anxious about the changes that were underway, and they were mourning real or anticipated losses of autonomy, respect, and income. 
Uh, I mean, Toby at that time, what actually led us to write, write this was in 2010, Toby, who had had this fantastic career as a cardiac surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, he did more card major cardiac cases, 22,000, than I think anyone has in the United States. And he was really loved and respected by his colleagues. And that's why he became CEO. But then he found that he, as he tried to do things, uh, people who had been his friends for, and, and who, who, who acted like they looked up to him, uh, they did look up to him, but they were deferential for decades beforehand, suddenly were ready to kill him. And the little event that, tip, that, that sort of set a riot in motion uh, was he decided to change the health insurance coverage for doctors so that everyone at the Cleveland Clinic would be on the same plan together, that doctors wouldn't be treated differently. And the only real difference was that doctors would now have to pay a co-payment when they went to see, see, get care at the Cleveland Clinic. And it led to a riot. And Toby had to meet with, you know, in town meetings. And he said to them, uh, you know, this doesn't make sense. You know, you're only going to the doctor an average of two times a year, and you have to pay $35 each time and he says you're filling your car with gas twice a week for and you're paying $35 what's the big deal uh, but what came out was a litany of little things but all of them you know adding up it, it just was like a you know the doctor's parking lot had been moved further away so the patients could park close to the ambulatory facility and physicians who were there were embarrassed to be bringing these things up like there's no more free food that kind of thing and they were embarrassed to bring it up but it, these were the kind of things that were eating at them so they were being told that they had to accept it accept it and they had to accept new organizational structures new ways of working new payment models and then at the same time they were struggling to care for this endless stream of patients and toby who really was shocked that Physicians were so mad. He actually, at the Cleveland Clinic, they had this blog where any physician could log on and write whatever they wanted and, and it, anonymously. And, um, and Toby brought out for me eight pages of, of single space, you know, eight point type uh, uh, of, of comments. And there were things that hurt his feelings. You know, there were things like, I never liked him, uh, you know, things like that. And, um, and so Toby concluded that doctors were moving through stages of grief. You know, they were mourning losses that hadn't even occurred in some cases. Uh, you know, they were anticipating more blows to their, uh, to what they had, what they believed that they had signed up for. There were a few that were still in denial, but there were many that were still in the anger phase. And so what Toby and I concluded as we talked about it, and he was the one who suggested this, he said, he said, I don't have any choice. He said, I've got to change the topic of discussion. He said, I've got to put the focus on something everyone considers more important than anything else. And that's patience and what they're going through and their suffering. Yes, I've got to do what I can to address the real issues uh, that, that are bothering them, but I've got to keep reminding them that it's, this is about patience and uh, could, and in the hopes that people would rise to the occasion. So some of you have seen the Cleveland Clinic Empathy video. Uh, if you haven't, you know, write down Cleveland Clinic Empathy video and at some point Google it and see this is one of the things that Toby did to try to remind people of what we're about. It was highly effective. It really went viral. And, and so in the article, we also talked about uh, you can't just can't give a, an emotional speech. You've got to be thoughtful about how you get people to do things. And we talked about Max Weber's multi-level approach to social action. You, you need a, a shared purpose, and that's what the video helps do, helps do. But then, you know, you need to be thoughtful about financial and non-financial incentives and peer pressure and so on. Anyway, so that's what we wrote about a decade ago. Now, uh, in the decade ahead, let me see, did I, all right, so we are, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, my thing's a little sensitive. Uh, okay, what's happened since? Well, it's been a wild decade, uh, a wild decade where frankly, 
uh, it's been a great decade in many ways. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has led to big changes. Many more people are covered by insurance. And, what, uh, and that is something great. I mean, I think many of you don't hardly ever see someone without insurance. And I can tell you that when Ron and I were your ages, you know, maybe like 10, 15% of patients would come in and they wouldn't have insurance. And it is annoying taking care of people who don't have insurance. You know, I mean, aside from the fact that those poor folks can't get the care that they need and the medications they need, it's irritating to like order a test and not have them go because they can't, they're worried about the financial consequences. So, uh, I mean, I know our irritation is not the big issue, but I can tell you, it is irritating to take care of patients who aren't covered is better to have people covered. I, regardless of how you feel, where you are in the political spectrum, uh, it's very nice having patients covered. Uh, there's been a gradual evolution of the payment system where fee-for-service is a little less prominent, but it's still pretty prominent in terms of how everything gets funded. Much greater use of IT. Uh, I can tell you that 20 years ago, at the turn of the century, when I was leading, helping lead the Partners Healthcare Network, we were having trouble getting physicians in our private practice physicians in our network in the community to all agree that you had to have a fax machine. There were some folks that didn't want fax machines, be, and the argument was, it'll put more paper in front of me and I've got too much paper already. That obviously, now we're trying to get people to not have fax machines and just use PDFs. Uh, so the IT stuff has moved along very quickly. There's been a steady progression to more organization of care, consolidation of physicians and hospitals. You just, uh, no, I, you know, I don't know, uh, what percentage of you will go into private practice, but I'll, it's going to be low and, and, there, and it'll be even lower a decade from now. Uh, bundled payments are slowly spreading. Vanderbilt is one of the leaders in the country in pushing real teams, integrated practice units, taking bundled payments. Um, you know, Vanderbilt's out ahead, frankly, compared to a lot of the country. Uh, COVID-19 has produced more change in the last few months than the prior decade has seen. You know, providers got organized to meet patients' needs without regard to financial consequences. That's been a great thing. The amount of telemedicine, uh, for example, uh, is, is just one of many man manifestations. But we, we did, and I'm going to go back into this a little bit, but we did what we had to do to take care of patients. And, um, and frankly, we paid a big price financially, but there's been a big upside. Uh, we paid the, that big financial price, though, was, was huge. Fee-for-service payments came nowhere near covering the cost, but ACOs did just fine. So these are, these are some huge lessons from the last decade. Um, okay, so the challenges ahead, you know, when we think about a year or two or beyond, uh, we've got the issues that we had bef before COVID, uh, you know, all of you are tuned into what burnout uh, is about and what's driving it, the explosion of knowledge, the explosion of complexity of, of, of care, uh, the pressures for improvement and the regulatory burdens uh, that flow from the ACA and the marketplace, the loss of autonomy as you have to work in teams to deliver state of the science care, the difficulty of working with IT. And then you add on to these things, all the stresses that were brought out and magnified by COVID-19 the fear, the exhaustion, the need to learn new ways of doing things. Like, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing a Zoom family visit later this morning with, with the children of one of my patients in other cities. You know, setting that up, I mean, that's not so hard, but I had to learn how to do it. Um, and then there's the financial impact of the recession. When we get through COVID, there's going to be, you know, an incredible increase in government debt. And that is going to trickle through and affect all of us. And the employers are sucking wind right now. And you know, they're having difficulty paying their rent. And they're, of course, going to be looking to contain their healthcare spending as much as possible. So these are the challenges that we're going to be facing. So preparing for lunch and these challenges, you know, we can handle them. And I know we will, and you will. You know, that's why you're in this MDA, MD MBA course. Uh, what Toby and I laid out were these six tests that can help. You, we, we think, this is our best guess 
of if you think about these tests and prepare yourself to plunge into them, that we think that there's a greater chance that you and your organizations at the end of the decade will look back and say, we did all right. Now, we listed them in ascending order of difficulty. Now, all of them sound benign. They're all, they all sound like mom and apple pie, but we, I'm gonna try to just characterize them enough so that you know, this isn't mom and apple pie. This, this is brutal stuff. This is difficult. And, uh, you know, we didn't do a decent job writing or, or, or me speaking about this stuff if they don't cause genuine discomfort, discomfort if you're pursuing them in earnest. I mean, we're talking about things that will lead to the kind of change over a decade. We're not, you know, we don't think these things can be taken on in a year. Uh, uh, but over a decade, we think these are the things that you should be shooting for. And then you should be making, uh, you should have a long-term audacious goal, but then, you know, every year you should have uh, modest achievable goals that are taking you in the direction of achieving the big longer term goal. Uh, we think at the end of the decade, these will be the things that have defined great leadership. So putting patients first, building super teams, plunging into competition, taking on costs, embracing innovation, grasping leadership. I know you're thinking, who can be against these kind of things? Well, my guess is you're going to find out <laughs> as you push these things. All right. So what do we mean by really putting patients first? Uh, and first, you know, to you know, bolster your convictions about why this is the right thing. I think COVID-19 has shown that how much the public appreciates it when not only the public, but your colleagues as well, your, your other doctors, other, you know, other clinicians, nurses and others and other staff, when you really put patients first and you don't think about the money stuff, uh, you know, you, you say that comes second, uh, people really respect it and appreciate it. Uh, now, this is press gainy data. And, you know, so press gainy you know, surveys patients all over the country. We do, you know, million, and we do most of U.S. healthcare. And, um, and uh, these are, this is the thing, that, the first thing to understand is that uh, healthcare continues to try to get better. And, and for most of the, the things that press gainy surveys, the, the country is improving. And we improve by about 1% per year for most of the measures uh, that we measure. And that's because uh, people are, are trying to get better in healthcare. So 1% per year. But when COVID hit, you know, we saw changes per month that were greater than the changes we ever saw per year. So if you look, you know, in the, on the bar graphs there, uh, at the country in, in dark blue, uh, you saw improvements of more than 1% uh, during that first month of COVID in how patients, you know, this is tens of millions of patients were rating their care in general, the teamwork, the skill of doctors, the skill of nurses. And it wasn't that suddenly our doctors got smarter or our nurses got smarter. I actually do think we started working better in, as teams uh, in the crisis, but patients suddenly really appreciated us more. Um, and then you see in the hot spots, Washington State, if you think back to what March was like, where Washington State and then New York City became the two big hot spots in the country, what you saw were, you know, jaw dropping increases. I mean, you see like in New York, 13% increases in people, how people rated their care, you know, in one month. I mean, keep in mind that this is, you know, 1% per year was what we usually have seen. And it has not gone down in New York. People really appreciate what we have done in healthcare. They see us at a time where, you know, they don't trust government uh, and, and many other institutions they actually trust us and, and that, and, and frankly, they should because of the way we behaved, we rose to the occasion, we put their interests first and we worried about our own safety second and we worried about money third. That was what they would want us to do and, and we did. 
Um, so thinking about building trust, that is part of what it means. Uh, that put, really putting patients first is the first step to building trust. And ultimately, building trust is a huge critical thing for having market share, for having patients want to come see you and having doctors, nurses, and others want to stay in your organization. So what is trust and what does it, why does it matter so much now? I mean, here's where, you know, this is part of what you should be learning as you go through this, these leadership and business training courses, you know, is, is how do you take something like that may seem abstract that uh, many of your colleagues will take for granted and, but that you, you excel in it because you are take, you are making it something that's uh, operational. You think about it and you, and you're more effective uh, than you otherwise would be. I mean, and trust is hugely important because I would say that in healthcare, we're at a high risk for taking trust for granted uh, or assuming that people are going to trust us. And that's because we know that we are good people and we know we work our tails off. And so we, we kind of think, I mean, they should trust us. I mean, look how good I am. Look how hard I'm working. Um, you know, come on, give me a break. Give, you know, trust me. Uh, but in a time, you know, in, in 2020, that's not enough. Um, you know, so how do you think about earning trust, building trust, you know, understanding what it is? Well, you know, trust is, uh, you know, trust is, a you know, part of the currency of social capital. Uh, now, you know, you guys have been learning something about financial capital. Financial capital is the money that enables Vanderbilt to do things it couldn't otherwise do. You know about human capital. Human capital are the people that enable Vanderbilt to do things it couldn't otherwise do. But social capital is generated by relationships among people that enable organizations to do things they otherwise could not. Uh, like for, and you know, an example I would give you of social capital uh, is, you know, when I, on one of my trips to Vanderbilt, Ron took me to VASAP, you know, the Vanderbilt Allergy Sinus and Asthma Program. I may have mixed up the two A's there, but by co-locating the, you know, the ENT physicians who know something about sinusitis and the pulmonologists who know something about asthma um, and uh, the allergists who know something about allergy and the radiologists who can do CTs and the pulmonary function people in one building. So they're running into each other in the hallway and they can talk about Mrs. Shabotnik, uh, who's coughing and sneezing and has a runny nose. Uh, that enables something that that just can't happen as well uh, if, if people are spread out all over the place uh, the way they usually are. So I bring up VASAP because it's uh, my guess is that uh, most or all of you are familiar with it. And, and, and the idea of social capital becomes real once you see it in action. So part of, so trust is a form of social capital. Uh, uh, now, one of the definitions of trust that I like from this book, you know, by Ronald Burke, sociologist, in University of Chicago, on an introduction to social capital, is you trust someone when you commit to a relationship before you know how the other person will behave. The more unspecified the terms, the more the trust is, in, is, is involved. I mean, it's one thing to, you know, trust is not a big deal when everything is very, very predictable. You know exactly what's going to happen and it actually happens. Where trust matters is where you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how care is going to be delivered. Uh, you don't know for sure whether there'll be enough PPE and ventilators and enough staffing. Uh, but if you're if if you have confidence that your leaders and your are you know have certain values and are going to really do the best they can, and if you have confidence that the colleagues around you are going to behave in certain ways. They're not gonna be sneaking out and looking out for themselves or something like that. Well, then you can trust that, uh, you know, you can commit to the relationship even though you don't know what's gonna happen. You know, another way, another little line Bert used, he says, you know, trust is confidence. You're going to be treated fairly in situations you have not even thought of yet. 
Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, many, I hope most of you are in relationships where you feel like you can trust uh, your partner, that they are going to behave in ways that you would feel good about in all sorts of situations that have, you haven't thought of, because frankly, uh, you know, situations are going to come up that are uh, you that you could not possibly have, have imagined. And um, so, right, so you get a feeling about what trust is about. And so COVID-19 has been a time where everything has been uncertain, care has been actively redesigned, and that's why trust is uh, so important now. Um, so when you think about what builds trust, uh, so I want to you know bring up the Anna Karenina principle, and um, I think you know, many of you know that uh, you know the first line of uh, this you know Tolstoy's mid nineteenth century novel, uh, eight hundred page novel uh, about the but the only line most people remember is the first one. You know, happy families are all like, and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So what the Anna Karenina principle means that, uh, you know, well, actually, I, I should elaborate on these on these bullet points. Uh, well, first, there are certain things that that make happy families happy, and those things should happen all the time. Uh, and same thing is true for great health care. But uh, the the down dark side of the anachronic principle is that a deficiency in any one of a number of factors can doom an endeavor to failure. So, and a successful endeavor is one where every possible deficiency has been avoided. And as I thought about the anachronic principle, uh, you know, it's really about high reliability. So a high reliability organization, there are two sort of flavors to high reliability. Uh, you know, the positive side, which is there are certain things that make care great, and you want to make sure that characterizes your care with every single patient. You know, the, the, the fact is, in, in patient care, you are starting from scratch with every single patient. And uh, no matter how wonderful you've been over the last decade, uh, you've got to be someone who listens and has genuine empathy and communicates well with the next patient you see. You've got to be, you know, you have got to be alike with all of them. At the same time, high reliability, high reliability care has to prevent a zillion different forms of failure. I mean, there are really a limited number of things that patients really value, and we've got to deliver them every single time. But then we've got to be worried about the zillion ways in which things can fall apart. Uh, so safety issues is a, is a very good example. You have to worry about all the kind of ways in which patients could be harmed and be an organization and an individual who is working relentlessly to make sure none of them happen. So here's an example of show with some real data on that show the anachronic principle in action. And this is from a major teaching hospital where my colleagues and I used AI and natural language processing to examine the comments from an entire year, and uh, an entire year of comments. And, and then with the AI, what you can do is you can sort, identify, uh, uh, you know, sort the comments, the insights into positive and negative ones, and then identify the, re the common themes and sub-themes that characterize, in this case, the positive comments. These are the happy families. These are the the situations where patients were moved to write something in their patient experience surveys that was positive uh, 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 and because they appreciated something. And this is just the, these are from five, the five major, five surgical, you know, nursing units, patient care units, and what are, and just the analysis of the positive comments. And you can see that what they appreciated, the major theme was identical for all five of these surgical units, courtesy and respect. And then there's some sub themes that came out, empathy and compassion, kindness, and so on and so on. So what people want, the, the happy family thing, they're happy in the same way, uh, it's like the how of the interactions that occur between uh, you know, uh, caregivers and patients. But then when you do the same kind of AI analysis for the negative comments, uh, what you see are a zillion different things that come out uh, is, is, you know, they vary on different floors. You see, this is like 
like patient safety stuff. There's skin ulcers, there are UTIs, there are you know, bloodstream infections. Uh, they have to worry about any of them can cause a problem. Similarly, it's the discharge process, it's the noise, um, you know, it's cleanliness, you know, we, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's patients feeling rushed. Uh, you know, so this is what I mean about high reliability. You gotta be completely reliable about the good stuff and you have to be completely vigilant to try to prevent the bad stuff. So the anacrina principle will be part of your management challenge. Those are two different things, being high reliable about the positive and high reliability about preventing the negative. So to do that, you need like an operating system and to really put patients in the center of care, you gotta commit to high reliability. You gotta really mean it. You have to convey the values. We did that with COVID. We put patient safety first. We were we worked together relentlessly and so on. We worked on empathy when patients couldn't be visited by their families and so on. And we created systems. You need systems to do it. You need data, you need AI and so on. Um, and then as you get more advanced, and I think Vanderbilt is among the most advanced AMCs, you, you, you actually are organizing around patient segments and you develop non-visit care models and, you know, working on equity. And, uh, I don't know if you do open notes, but that's like, you know, a good thing to do. All right. So really putting patients first means organizing to do it, you know, really having the values, but becoming high reliability about putting patients first. Building super teams. Now, you know, this book, Team of Teams, probably some of you know it. It's not a healthcare book. It's a military book or lessons learned from the military for how you deal with uh, a resilient, unpredictable enemy. This was developed uh, with things, lessons learned from uh, the worldwide effort against Al-Qaeda that was led by Stanley McChrystal in the 2004 to 2008 time. Um, so there's, this is a great book for learning about what real teams are like. You know, real, you know, the, if you think about the Navy SEALs as like uh, the ultimate uh, model for a great team, uh, you know, they go off with their 10 weeks of training not to become super soldiers, as McChrystal puts it, but to become super teams. They do all this crazy stuff like stay awake for two and a half days, uh, the goal was to have everyone help each other stay awake. It's really about making people bond and feel like they are a unit, completely committed to getting the job done. And the job in healthcare uh, is taking great care of your, of your group of patients. Now, I can tell you that uh, teams are valued by patients and they're valued by your colleagues. And we've got a ton of data, Press Ganey, that show an extremely strong relationship between how people at a place like Vanderbilt feel about the teamwork and every single performance metric, including you know, profitability, but patient experience and safety, quality of care, length of stay, readmissions. You know, when you look across the country, the higher the people at an institution rate their teamwork, the teamwork in their institution, the better the organization does. So as you guys go into your leadership positions, building great teams, should you should consider that like a very central part of your job. It is the best form, diff, durable form of competitive differentiation. Uh, you know, new technologies are not only going to carry you so far, but great teamworks will carry you, you know, indefinitely. Uh, great teams are not only, it's not just multidisciplinary groups where everyone works at the top of their license. They are a unit and they've got resilience and the ability to adjust to unanticipated challenges. This is what this book, Team of Teams, was based upon, was what McChrystal and his colleagues figured out that Al-Qaeda was unpredictable and it was resilient and they were going to pop up and do un unanticipated things, they needed, they couldn't just use their traditional organizational structure where everyone and have everyone do their job. They needed teams that were going to be flexible and deal with whatever came up. And then they needed those teams to work like a team of teams in dealing with what, whatever came up. Great teams need clear goals and are thus most effectively organized around patient segments. This is why Jeff Balzer, uh, your CEO at Vanderbilt, as like I met him working with Michael Porter at Harvard Business School. 
Uh, he sort of gets that. That's why you, Vanderbilt has moved toward teams and IPUs. And then you need the system, operating systems that go with them. Uh, plunging into competition on value of care. Now, I, I, we included this one because the truth is physicians have been ambivalent about competition and they've been ambivalent about transparency because we know how complex our work is and we are scared that we will be treated unfairly in competition that you know whatever the playing field is won't take into account that we've got you know you've got a ton of medicaid patients at vanderbilt for example um but what was so i i actually up until like about 50, 10 years ago, I used to say competition is a mixed bag and transparency is a mixed bag. Uh, but then I started working with this economist at Harvard Business, and she's now at Harvard Business School, Limor Daphne. She's in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, we wrote this article together that uh, about competition. And the defining moment in my discussions with her, when I was talking to her about how competition and transparency could have a downside in healthcare, she said to me, you know, Tom, have you ever noticed that everyone thinks competition and transparency are good ideas for everyone else other than themselves? And when she said that, I had to laugh because I knew it was true. And then she said, you know, so that should make you think maybe competition and transparently, transparency are the right things for us too. And I think she's right. I mean, yeah, there's can be downsides to anything, but there's a bigger downside to not plunging into competition. Because if we in healthcare don't plunge into competition on value, try to make our care better and try to make it more efficient, the marketplace is going to use regulation to try to accomplish those goals. And I've never met any doctor who thinks regulation has made their life better. So even though I'm a liberal Democrat from Massachusetts, uh, I actually believe you need, there has to be a prominent role for market forces and competition and the physicians should plunge into it uh, as opposed to try to minimize this impact on them. So one way to sort of differentiate whether you're plunging in for you guys, I would I'd encourage you to always make a distinction between two types of activities. There's game playing and there's value creation. And I don't mean to be pejorative about game playing, but like game playing is when you do you you try to get paid as much as possible for doing what you're already doing you know, and contracting and, uh, you know, uh, you know, to try to get paid as well as you can. I am all for that. You know, you should do that. Um, uh, but value creation is when you change what you're doing in order to make care better or make it more efficient. You know, VASAP is, a, is, a, is an example where getting together, they created value for patients. I really believe the game playing is important. I don't really think that doctors have that much to contribute to the game playing, but you need to have good people working on it. But value creation, I think that we are the ones who have the most, val most ability to lead the creation of value. And then you have to actually commit to learning from other places and uh, being transparent with what you do. Those things, that's, and it's challenging to do that. Okay, really taking on costs. Um, this is more than just trying to become efficient in what you do. I mean, the graphic on the right side is one that you're, you're familiar with the concept, which is that in the United States, we spend more than anyone else, but like our, our, our population does not seem to be living longer. We're sort of in the middle of the pack and, uh, and, and we can't compete you know, uh, economically. We can't feed everyone. We can't give everyone good housing and education and so on. So we actually, the patriotic, Thing to do uh, is to do more than just try to become more efficient. We should, real leadership is like thinking about, okay, what will it take to actually reduce total spending on healthcare? Uh, that's something more than blunting the rate of rise is trying to eliminate waste and reducing total spending. If we were in a war, I think all of us would recognize we would have to like try to reduce healthcare spending so we could spend money on the war effort. The truth is we're kind of in a war, you know, we're, you know, we do need to reduce total spending. So this is what I mean about these challenges are uncomfortable. So if, if, if you are able to, to, to step up to the plate and say, actually reducing spending is, 
is the right thing for a real leader, then, then how do you go about it? Well, you know, you uncouple income from the volume of services performed. I mean, that's like a basic first step. It's not an easy step. It means disrupting the way people get paid and everyone gets nervous about that. Uh, you have to try to create cultural norms in which reducing costs is part of excellence and being wasteful is, is something that would lead to people being scorned by their colleagues. Uh, I think all of us today would speak up when we see, saw care was unsafe. Like we saw, saw someone not doing hand hygiene and then like doing a procedure uh, with a patient, you would, uh, you know, speak up, I would hope. Um, but I don't know that many of us would speak up when we saw a colleague doing something where we didn't think the care had any value at all, as long as it didn't harm people. Uh, I think that in the future, actually speaking up when we see colleagues being wasteful, uh, that's, I think that's gonna be part of being really excellent. It's basically putting the Choosing Wisely campaign on steroids. Um, okay, I'm gonna race through these last ones so we can get to the discussion. You know, really embracing innovation. I think we have to recognize that our culture is hardwired to make change difficult. And we all want to think of ourselves as innovative. But the truth is, you know, you know, like they say in Hollywood, everyone loves a failure. Uh, they love to talk about it. We kind of like that in medicine, too. We're ready to pounce on anyone whose idea did not work out. Um, now, why is that? Well, you know, we've got selection processes that emphasize smart people will never make mistakes. I my guess is that for the people in your class, the average grade on organic chemistry was an A. And, uh, and even though I would also guess that none of us have used organic chemistry in the last year, well, maybe one or two of you. Um, so we want people who are able to do the work and be disciplined enough to be perfect. But the truth is today in medicine, emotional intelligence and grit may be more important than high MCAT scores, you know, because medicine's a team sport and we have to be trying to learn and get better. You know, resilience is a better predictor of innovation than brilliance. I think that's very well established in, in the business literature. And so real innovation takes creativity, but it also takes courage and it takes patience because things don't work out the first time. You got to hang in there over years. And the COVID-19 pandemic shown us what we've been used for. Uh, you know, this quote, you know, like we, a lot of times we squash innovations because we say there's no evidence that this is beneficial. Uh, Peter Orzag, he's a really brilliant guy, said in one of the meeting that I helped organize, healthcare is at a point where we have to be ready to try things as long as there isn't evidence that it's harmful. This is the opposite of uh, what, we, what we often say. And then my last thing is there's, there's, we have to actually grasp what leadership is. You know, we, we can't just assume that because we're doctors, we, we know it. You guys know that. That's why you're taking uh, this program. Uh, you know, there's a curriculum to it. And I think you're learning it, you know, strategy, management skills, emotional intelligence, culture change. I helped Harvard Business Review put together these two books, you know, must reads on leadership and must reads on strategies. You know, about four of the 10 articles are, are healthcare, uh, but about six of them are classics. You know, I'm not, I don't get any money from this book. I didn't get paid anything to work on it. I worked on it because I wanted the young trainees I work with to have them in a book. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, you know, there's a curriculum there and I, I'm glad you guys are taking it on. So my conclusion is I, I really think that data experience and common sense are all pointing in the same directions. The physicians are going to be most effective in putting patients first and, or, you know, uh, we we'll want to put patients first and organize great teams. Uh, they're going to be able to innovate, compete and control costs so that their care is affordable to patients. And the organizations that cultivate this type of physician leadership have the best shot at doing more than surviving. They may actually thrive. And so I'm hoping that if you guys can take on these six tests, tests in the decade ahead, you're going to be well positioned for the decade after that. Okay, so with that, let me uh, uh, see what you think and get your questions and comments and uh, you can use the chat. You can, and by the way, my email is thomas.lee at pressganey.com. Happy to interact with any of you guys uh, to explore things in, in, in depth later on. So we're now open for questions, as Dr. Lee said, either by chat or asking a question. So uh, 
First question from whomever. Okay, I'll open up with the first question. <laughs> so Tom, to take this from the hypothetical to the concrete, looking for progress, you've mentioned Vanderbilt has some progressive areas, some of which have actually been established a long time ago, but still would be considered progressive now. What other places in the country might have examples of going to the future, leadership, IPUs, things, things that you espouse we should all be going towards? Well, you know, I think that uh, the truth of the matter is, I, I bring up Vanderbilt a lot as I travel around the country and speak at AMCs, because most AMCs are having a horrible time rising to the occasion. And um, I think Vanderbilt has been uh, unusually effective. I mean, I know everything looks better from the outside than it probably feels on the inside. I think that's a basic principle. And you guys know, probably know dysfunction at Vanderbilt that I overlook or don't know about. Uh, but I do think highly about, you know, what Vanderbilt's been able to do. It's hard to come up with who I would put number two among great AMCs in terms of rising to the occasion. But the fact is that when you look at where leadership in healthcare delivery is coming from these days, uh, uh, you know, it's actually not coming, it's certainly not coming out of the Harvards and Yales and Hopkins in terms of they're not, people from there aren't going to other places and being the big leaders of healthcare delivery. Uh, it's, you know, overwhelmingly, you know, the Cleveland clinics, the Mayo clinics, you know, the Inner Mountains, the uh, Geisingers, uh, the, 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 the places that don't really have a real, ac you know, research education program on the scale that Vanderbilt does or where I work does. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, like people from Cleveland Clinic, for example, have spread out and they're running Intermountain, they're running Ascension, they're running Innova, uh, you know, and because people that have been in real organizations and, and learned what it means to organize, to improve, to improve value for patients, uh, they are the ones who are taking on the leadership roles in healthcare delivery today. Um, now, I had this conversation on a panel with a, a, you know, my friend and colleague at the Brigham, Atul Gawande, about this. And, and Atul said, and he really upset some people at the Brigham when he said this, um, he said the Brigham, where he and I both trained, he said the, Brigham is a, is the, the, the Brigham's role is not to be innovative in care delivery, it's to train innovators and uh, to sort of nurture them with values and stuff. And then they can go out else, elsewhere and actually change the world. And uh, it pissed off so many people, I can't tell you, because you know, we all wanna believe we can do everything because we're so smart and we work so hard. Um, I think, I hope that there's some truth but not complete truth to what he says. Um, but uh, I think Vanderbilt is doing as good a job of, uh, you know, doing both. Uh, but I think that, you know, what I would say is don't spend your time looking down your noses at the Cleveland Clinics and Mayo Clinics because they have a lot fewer Nobel Prizes that have been produced. Uh, but, uh, but say, okay, what can we learn from them that we might adapt for the environment that we're going to work in? Um, so... Anyway, so that's a little bit of babbling about uh, you know, precipitated by your question, Ron. Thank you. Um, there was a chat uh, from Sarah Rohde. Yeah. Sarah, you want to ask the question? I said, when you are closing or interviewing potential team members, uh, you know, how do you look for characteristics like grit? Uh, well, you know, this is something my cousin Angela gets asked about all the time. And, you know, she developed the grit scale when she was, uh, a grad student, you know, she went to West Point and she tried to predict which, she, she developed this tool for predicting which uh, uh, cadets would drop out and because 20% don't make it all the way through and it's not only crushing for them, but, you know, it's a huge investment by the U.S. government that gets wasted when someone does not make it all the way through. So the grid scale is a scale that many of you may have taken and that one can take, but it's not a good screening tool. Uh, because it's a tool for self-reflection and uh, anyone can game it if it's being used for screening people. But 
what you do is, you know, you look for certain things, like do people hang in there? If they change from thing to thing to thing every year, that's not a good sign. That's a warning sign. Uh, you know, but, but sticking with something over years and pushing and continually getting better, sort of climbing the ladder, uh, even if they don't reach the top, but they got better and better and they, 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 they moved into, you know, significant responsibility roles in whether it's, whether it's sports or the chess team or something like that. So, so hanging in there, improving excellence, that, that means something, um, and I can tell you that observing people over time really matters. I mean, Mayo Clinic uses this two by two table uh, uh, where, okay, like every two by two table, I didn't need to draw this out for you, uh, but they have values on the Y axis. Do they have the right values, respect, team, good team member, that kind of thing, or not? And then on the X axis is, do they work hard? Do they get up and see patients? And, or do they like, try, to, try to avoid getting up and seeing patients? Yes or no. And obviously what they want are the people with, who work hard and have the right values. And they wanna stay away from people who don't work hard and are, are jerks. Um, but what they have found over time is that if someone works hard and sees a lot of patients, but doesn't have good values, they, they, can, they hardly ever change. And they try, they try to avoid those folks or get away from them as soon as they can. They have found that if people have the right values, but they're not productive, they try to convert them, teach them how to be more productive. They say their success rate is about 20%. It's really hard to change people. So that means who you hire really matters. This is why most of the faculty at Mayo have come out of their own training program or their med school. They, they, they know them and those people know what they're getting into. And uh, they look at training as an eight year job interview. So really, you know, looking at your candidates, like really looking at them, you know, hopefully if you, you work with them, that's a big advantage, but then really talking to the people where they worked uh, before to understand, do they have the right values and do they work hard? It's a very important thing. There's probably time for just one more question from Young Kim. There's a tension between innovation and lowering costs. Innovation loses out in health. Uh, oh, okay. What's the optimal path to excessive deprior? I don't uh, to excessive deprioritization of innovation. I actually think that improvement of value is like the 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 true north to focus on. And value isn't an equation that you can calculate. Uh, you know. You know you're improving value if you are improving patients' outcomes without raising costs, or you're lowering costs without reducing their outcomes. Uh, and ideally, you're going to be doing both, um, improving outcomes and lowering costs. Now, I know that there are going to be innovations, new drugs and so on, that improve outcomes and raise costs, and that's progress. But we need to have some big subset of people like you and DMBAs and so on who are thinking, I am succeeding. I'm having a good year if I have improved value. And I know I've improved value if I've done something to improve outcomes or lower costs, ideally both. Uh, if I haven't improved, it, you know, moved in that direction, then I'm not sure I accomplished anything in this last year. Okay, so it is quarter of, and I am going to log off my virtual visit with my first patient. And uh, uh, I'm sorry to uh, leave abruptly, but uh, I know that you know that's what I'm supposed to. I'm sorry I didn't leave more time for questions. Um, I will, uh, you got my email, and uh, I will be happy to, I really will be happy to be in touch and try to be helpful to any of you. See you guys. Um, thank you so sincerely. We really very much appreciate this. Thank Bye you. Now. Bye bye.